scripture reading will be from Mark 16, 14 through 16. Afterward he, appeared to, afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes in the gospel will be, and baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. All right. Thank you, Nick. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Man, really excited to uh, spend the morning with you guys. Um, And and this is, we're wrapping up, uh, this is a, boy, one, two, three, four-week sermon series that we are wrapping up today. And um, this, today is going to be on this idea of life on mission. And so, so kind of backing up, uh, over the last several weeks, we, we really unpacked uh, well, what the gospel is, what a disciple is, uh, and, and unpacked in the first week really what the, what the mission was. And so today is going to be more digging into the, to the heart of what the mission is and what that, that, uh, that empowers us to do uh, in and through our life. And so, um, so my name is John. I uh, know most of you guys in here. Um, one of the one of the members of the leadership team here at the Journey Hiram, and uh, normally I get the, the pleasure of serving um, with the band, um, but I know Brian stepped out, so I, I don't have a problem thanking him for, uh, for his service, but, uh, but Brian, Ted, and Aaron, um, just want to thank them for stepping in and you know, always being ready to, uh, to do a great job and lead us in worship by, uh, by just being empowered by the Holy Spirit, and so I just want to thank them for, uh, for what they do for us, and so so Nick just read this scripture verse out of Mark, and um, we're going to spend some time there. Uh, but before we do, I just want to recap a little bit of what the last couple weeks looked like. Because so two weeks ago we spent time, and Jose preached on this idea of life on life, and uh, and the point of the life on life was that you know as disciple makers, if that's our mission to to make disciples by being disciples, um, that there's this expectation that we have to live lives that are that are both accessible and available to those around us, um, so that we might, you know, we, we would, in our, in our daily lives, as people come in, and they're in our homes, and we have dinner with each other, that, uh, that they would see the brokenness of who we are in our life, because, because it's in that brokenness that we get to proclaim the good news, um, and so then we, then the next week, uh, Dave spent some time talking about life in community, and, you know, church, it really, it takes a community to raise each other up in Christ, um, one of the things Dave said last week that, man, it hit home with me hard is, is he's going around the room and he says, you know, he says, Anthony, I need Christ in you for me. And Jose, I need Christ in you for me. That, that all together we are equipped by the, by the, the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit of Jesus, that we might, we might equip each other to uh, do the good work of the gospel. And so it is in community that, that uh, the hope of Jesus is in all of us to grow. And so it's in that community that, um, that we live life together. And so today on this, this idea of life on mission, it really, really brings everything together because you can't have really one without the other. Um, if you're just life on life, but you're not really living in community with somebody, then, then the mission is lost. Uh, if we just happen to live in community with each other, but we don't spend time in each other's lives, then where's the platform for us to, to speak the gospel to do the mission. And so if we just live life with each other and we just live in community with each other, but, but there's never any gospel proclamation, then, then there's no mission. And so this idea of mission, uh, I think sometimes um, you know, we, we really try to complicate this idea of mission. We think, uh, man, this mission, we, we have to uh, we got to plan things. We have to, I mean, think about some of the mission trips that we've done. And we go out and, you know, we travel ar- across the world. And, and there's like weeks leading up to this trip that we spend time preparing. And, um, you know, maybe it's learning, learning a little bit of the new language that we're going to go into and learning a little bit about the culture so that we can, we can relate to those people. And, and so we, we spend all this time getting ready for the mission. And we go on the mission. We spend a week there. And then, then we come home. Um, while that's great, while that is uh, spreading the good news, um, church, I will, I will challenge you today that 
God has been preparing you every day of your life to be on mission. Um, you are prepared by living in this culture, in this city, here in Hiram, and in Powder Springs, and in Ackworth, and in Kennesaw, and the surrounding cities. Uh, you are in the culture. You know the culture already. And so uh, we are not called to be on mission on mission trips only. Uh, we are called to be on mission in the everyday of life. That means every, every opportunity we have when we're sitting at a restaurant, uh, when we are at somebody's house, when we are at the movies, when we are, uh, we are hanging out at a coffee shop listening to live music, uh, we get to be on mission because we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so that's really what this morning is going to be about. And um, let me pray for us as, as we go in and we unpack this verse in Mark, um, or these several verses in Mark when he talks about proclaiming the gospel to the whole creation. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning and we, uh, we first thank you. We thank you that you are the God of all creation. Uh, we thank you that it was in your breath, God, that we have life. We thank you that, <clears throat> that God, you pursue us, that, that we are your image bearers, your creation, and, and even in our trespasses, even in our iniquities, God, even as we sinned against you and we rebelled against you, uh, you came after us. Um, God, you always had a plan from the very beginning. And that plan was that, that we would be your people and you would be our God. Um, Father, we, uh, we are humbled by that, that thought that God, we can't work hard enough to earn your favor. That we can't perform well enough to be seen as holy before you. God, that humbles us, but Father, you completed the work. You completed the work by sending your son Jesus to, to live a life of perfection. To live a life that we could not live. To live a life in, in full submission and obedience to you. Jesus did that and He went to the cross to, to take on the sin of the world. God, on that cross, he, these words resonate with me uh, today and He says, it is finished. Jesus said it was finished as he was, laying, as, as he was hung on a cross. God, for His people. And Father, we know that uh, the story doesn't end there because Jesus comes back and He gives us, gives us a mission. He tells us that that we get to go proclaim this good news to the, the entire creation, to, to all the people, to the mind, body, and spirit of every person and thing that is out there, God. We get to proclaim the good news. And I pray this morning that, um, that Your Spirit would come and fill this room. It would fill our hearts, God, and that we would, we would know that it's not based on our works. It's not based on our performances, God, but it is, it is based on You and the power that You give us through Your Holy Spirit that that we are able to share this good news, that hearts are able to be changed, that, um, that lives are, are pointed towards You. God, that we would create this multiplication of disciples who make disciples for You. God, I thank You again for, for this day, for this time that we get to share with each other as a family, that we get to equip one another uh, to do the work. God, again, I pray for your spirit that you would be with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And so, um, so as we look back at the scripture verse, and it was starting in uh, chapter 14, I want, to, I want to back up a little bit. Uh, because the, the first word in, in verse 14 says, afterward. Well, so that the first thing I'm thinking of, well, what happened first? So, uh, so let's back up just a little bit. And back to verse 9, and I'm going to reread that, and it'll give us a little more context as to what Jesus is saying and why he's rebuking his disciples as they're at the table. And so, starting in verse 9, it says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week. And so when he rose, this is Jesus being resurrected out of the tomb. And uh, he, had, he had been hung on a cross, and he was crucified, and they, and they put him in a tomb, and he was there for three days. And on the third day, on the first day of the week, Jesus, he rose. Uh, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. So Mary ran to, to go tell. She, she 
she saw Jesus, and what was the first thing that she wanted to do? The first thing that she did, man, she wanted to go tell everybody. She ran back. She ran back to the disciples then they, as they were mourning and weeping because they just realized Jesus, Jesus had been, been killed and they were still mourning that death of Jesus. She runs back to them and says, tells everybody who she just saw, but when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Hmm. So continuing on in verse 12, it says, After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest. So again, Jesus has appeared, and, and what do they do? They run back to tell the rest. There's this, 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 this passion, this heart of, oh my gosh, who did I just, I just saw Jesus. I need to go tell everyone about that. And so, uh, as they, were, um, and they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. So then in chapter 14, uh, afterward, he appeared to the 11 disciples. So Jesus first appeared to Mary, then to two others, and then to the disciples as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Starting in chapter 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And so I want to start with this, the first part of that verse that gives us a little context of what's going on here. But the first part of uh, chapter 15, or verse 15, it says, go into all the world. Go into all the world. And so when I hear that go into all the world, go is, it requires action. It's not, go does not mean like, hey, let's just, let's just get together once a week and you know, we'll hang out together on Sunday morning and sing some songs and, you know, listen to, uh, to the Scripture and, uh, you know, maybe we'll go eat lunch afterwards and then, then we're going to go home. That's not what go means. Go is, go is action. Go, uh, you know, it says go into all the world. Go into all the world. Go into every place, every part of life. You know, I think of all the world. Sometimes we get hung up on all the world as just like, the physical locations of all the world, but there's, God created everything in the world. He created work, our finances, our marriages, our relationships, our families, our possessions, our egos, our failures, our bad decisions, every square inch of the world, and the heart. Go into all the world. Requires action. And in this action, uh, he tells us exactly what we are to do. What is that action? It's to proclaim. It's to proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And when I think of whole creation, God created everything with, a, with His breath. He created us. Uh, he molded us into His image bearers. Proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, the mind, the body, and the spirit. Uh, we... We get to proclaim it to every part of our being because the gospel applies to everything. This is our mission, church, to make disciples who make disciples by proclaiming the gospel. And so, um, so remember, we defined what a disciple is a few weeks ago, and I just want to recap that just to make sure. Uh, we will not spend a lot of time here, but just want to recap and uh, make sure we're all on the same page. But if our mission is to make disciples who make disciples by proclaiming the gospel, well, well what is a disciple? Uh, and so on the board behind us, we see uh, a disciple is a person who increasingly worships Jesus in all of life, is being changed by Jesus in all of life, and obeys Jesus in all of life, and teaches others to do the same. And so if that's a disciple, what, what is discipleship? And so discipleship uh, is leading people to increasingly bring all of life under the lordship and empowerment, powering presence of Jesus. So if that's our mission, uh, let's dig into this idea of proclaim. Uh, we are to proclaim the gospel. And so as I read that the first time earlier in the week, and I thought, All right, you know, so we have to proclaim the gospel. What does that mean? I guess I just need to go and I get to tell some people about that. I get to tell some people about the good news of Jesus. And so I started digging in a little bit more, and, and so I pulled up the definition of proclaim. And the definition of proclaim is to announce officially or publicly. I thought, okay, that's, that's interesting, but 
So I dug back a little bit deeper, and, and I got to the Latin root of proclaim. And so the Latin root of proclaim is to cry out. To cry out. And I thought about that, and I said, man, when we cry out, there's usually this sense of, of desperation. Right? We have this, we are desperate when we're crying out for something, when we're on our knees crying out to, to God, when we're crying out to uh, maybe a friend or a coworker. There's a sense of desperation there. And so I think, church, we are called to desperately cry out. We are called to desperately cry out to the whole creation, the gospel of Jesus. And it reminded me of Jeremiah. And so, you know, Jeremiah, back in, in chapter 20, um, verse 9, he says, <clears throat> he says, If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more of his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. Church, we are called to cry out the good news of the gospel. There are people out there that are in desperate need of this good news. When I say out there, there are people right here. Right here in Hiram. Right here in Powder Springs. In your neighborhoods. Uh, your neighbor across the street. We're called to cry out. To desperately proclaim. Um, church, my, uh, my heart weeps for the people in this city that, that don't know the good news. We have, we have the greatest story that has ever been told. We have the greatest picture of redemption that, that it's not because of us that we get eternal life, but it's because of the perfect work of Jesus. And how can we hold that in? Jeremiah says, how can we hold that in? It's a fire that is, burnt, that is, that is shut up in our bones. And if we hold that in, church, we are weary. We are weary. And it should lead us to, to complete and utter obedience in the Word, which is to proclaim, to cry out. Um, but every time we talk about mission, there's, there's always this sense that, um, that I've got to do something, that I have to do the work, that I have to muster up the energy to, I've got to go and talk to my neighbor, I've got to go and spend time in a city, and I gotta, I've got to go and do all this stuff. And, and church, I will remind us and encourage us again that the work has already been done. That we don't have to muster up the courage. As a matter of fact, in Luke um, chapter 19, uh, and I, I think, believe this is going to be on the, verse, on the board behind us, but starting in verse 37, and this is Jesus as He is heading into Jerusalem. And, and we're at the point of His ministry where you know, He's going into Jerusalem before He is crucified, and, and His disciples and His followers are around Him, and they're proclaiming Him as King and as Lord. And then starting in verse 37, it says, As He was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of His disciples began to rejoice and praise God with loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Place in heaven and glory, and peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And as I read that this week, I thought, that's good news, church. Because we're not going to be able to proclaim the gospel perfectly. We are broken people. We are imperfect people. And as much as we think that we're going to proclaim the gospel well, it's not up to us. It's up to the Spirit to change the heart. And, and the good news here is that... Um, and Jesus says, like, even if, even if my people that I give in this great commandment, even if they don't proclaim the gospel, that they don't say that I am Lord and I am King, the very stones will cry it out. That is good news, church. It is not up to us. It is up to the Spirit. We are to live in obedience of the Word, to proclaim, to desperately cry out, to desperately bring good news to people who need it desperately. Think about how differently it would look if we fully understood our responsibility to share the gospel. How would that change everything that you do? How would that change the way you spend your time? How would that change the way uh, your relationships are with each other? If you knew how many people around you desperately need to hear this. How many people around you that are 
that are living a life that they think is, I'm okay, I'm good. Got a roof over my head, I have food on my table every day, a job that provides for me. But they don't understand the saving grace of, of Jesus Christ. Do we understand that this is the intensity in which we are to share this? Church, we have the best news in the entire world. If, if we had a magic pill that could cure everything, would we not share that? Would we, would we not go running to the top of the, of the mountains to scream it out to say we have, we have healing, we have restoration, we have eternal life right here? We have that church. We have that story. We have that good news. There are people who desperately need that. And in order to proclaim, in order to cry out the gospel, um, we need to understand what that is. Uh, you know, and how do we understand what that is unless someone teaches us? Right? There's, there's this, this order in which we have to, to come un, into belief. And into belief, then, we, then we're able to share and teach. And so I look in, in Romans chapter 10. And in Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 10 through 15, says, For... With the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the Scripture says everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Church, and I want to back this up because, you know, how are they to hear without someone preaching? And I don't mean just standing up here on a Sunday morning sharing the good news. I mean preaching in, you have someone over for dinner and they tell you about the depression that they've been dealing with. You get to preach the good news into that. I'm talking about preaching when someone comes to you and tells you that their marriage is falling apart. That they just can't do it on their own. I'm talking about the people who you're spending time with and they are, they are confessing that they are horrible parents. That they don't love their children well. We get to speak good news into that church. That is, that is the preaching of the gospel. We are all saints. We are all, uh, we are all believers. And we get, to, we get to share this good news. And if you are a believer, you are a saint. A church, sometimes we are saints who forget. This is why we need to hear the good news over and over again. But at the same time, we get to, we get to be on mission to the everyday things of life. So it's not a huge mission trip. This is not something we're planning for weeks. This is something that God has been preparing your heart for for a long time. We get to be on mission every single day of our lives. So the word gospel means good news. The word gospel means good news. And the gospel, the gospel is the good news. That for God's glory, Jesus died for our sin and He was resurrected so that we might move from death to life. This is a beautiful statement, church. And you know this, that that the gospel is, is good news that for God's glory, this is not for our glory, this is good news for Him, that Jesus died for our sin, and that He was resurrected so that we might be resurrected out of our, out of our flesh, sin-filled bodies, from a life of death to a life full of life. Because we know that the, the penalty for sin is death, and we are all a people full of sin, full of brokenness. But we get, to, we get to pass from death to life. We get to pass from death to life. And in John chapter 5, we hear Jesus speaking on that. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So church, if we are alive in Christ, if we have this good news in us, we are called to proclaim, to cry out desperately to those who need it. 
And the last part of the verse that Nick read for us is whoever believes will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. What does that mean? What does that, what does that mean to be saved? And this is, where, this is where we get to share this to those people who don't know Jesus yet, who don't understand the saving power of Jesus. And in John chapter 3, verse 14, it says, and As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. That's what it means to be saved, church, that we have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever ever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 is one of those verses that everybody knows. But does everybody know John 3.17? We continue on, it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. There are people out there, church, that need to be saved. They, they need to understand this good news. They need to hear the good news. And we know in Romans that if we can just explain it to them, if they can just hear it, it will lead them to belief. And in that belief, they'll have eternal life. Continuing on in John chapter 5, starting in verse 29, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. And He has given Him authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There are two parties out there, church. One that, one that knows and believes and will be saved. And those that don't, that reject and that will be condemned. And I, and I want to remind us as we... Uh, as we wrap up this idea of what it looks like to be on mission in the everyday of life. This is not a mission trip. This is life. This is life. You come in contact with people every single day. You with your friends, with your coworkers, with whoever it may be. What would it look like if we were at a restaurant today and you received the worst service possible? It was horrible. They never filled up your drinks. Your food came out cold. What if you still gave him a tip? I know it sounds crazy because we live in this world where, hey, in order for me to give you something, you need to provide me something. But the world that we live in, church, with, with Jesus as the head of our church, says you don't have to do anything for me to give you something. I've already given it to you. What this should look like in our everyday life, church, is this should demand a response. This should demand a question. We should serve and love in a way and share the gospel in such a way that, that people go, why? Why are, you, why are you tipping me like this? I didn't do anything to earn this. Because that opens up the doors for us to be on mission, church. Because when someone asks that question, we get to answer it with good news. We get to answer it with saying, I know that you provided me terrible service and you know, and I'm maybe a little upset about that. But the good news is that I provide terrible service to my father every single day. And he still loves me. And he still paid the price for me. And he still created a way for me to have eternal life. And I want you to know this today. I want you to know this today. And it's, it might be a few dollars and a tip. But I want you to know that the Father loves you too. And you don't have to earn this. It's already been paid for for you. That's just one example, church, of what it looks like to be on mission in the everyday of life. What it looks like to, to cry out, to desperately share the good news with all those that are around us. With all those that are around us. You know, another example might be with that person who has a failing marriage. And so I'm reminded of the story of, of this couple that Courtney and I knew back in Florida. And 
They had two kids, two young kids. And we were living life with these people. That We were in community with these people. And we spent a lot of time with them. And they owned a restaurant in, in the city downtown Mount Dora. Um, it's a little, little city outside of Orlando, Florida. And um, the devil broke into their marriage. And it broke them. Uh, in such a way that, that the wife, um, she was unfaithful. And she, and she ran away from her husband. But the good news um, that was continually being poured in to this husband was, do you not run away from God every day? You get to pursue her. You get to run after her. And he did for over a year. He pursued her. And he loved her continually. And so Courtney and I, we got, to, uh, <laughs> we got to go back home a few months ago. And uh, we saw the restoration that the gospel can provide. We got invited over to their house because he moved back in with her. And um, she, has, she is working through repentance in what she has done. And she is, she's seen the picture of the gospel in her husband that just never gave up. We got to go over and we got to have breakfast with them, sitting around a table with their two kids. And I thought about that and I was like, whew, back up six months from now, the idea of this happening would have, been, would have been impossible. Would have been impossible. But it's only by that good news, church, it's only by that grace that we got to sit around that table and have breakfast and pray with them and share a meal with them. That's the good news, church, that people need to hear. And we're on mission in every day of life. We're not just on mission here on Sunday morning when we come and we get to proclaim the good news, which we do, but this isn't the only part of it. You heard a couple weeks ago, we have 21 meals a week, most of us, anyway, that we can spend with people. That we can spend with people, that we can, we can share. And, and, you know, Jose said it so well, and I'll repeat it, but... But he said, you know, think about every time that we share a meal together, we are proclaiming that we cannot sustain ourselves on our own. That's exactly what Jesus does for us. We can't sustain ourselves on our own because if we, if we stick to ourselves and we, and we rely on our flesh, it will, it will lead to death. It will lead to death. But if we rely on Jesus to sustain us, we rely on His work on the cross, to make us righteous and holy and perfect before the Father. Church, we have eternal life. And that is worth celebrating. That is worth celebrating. Let's pray.